This is Glastonbury Abbey. It has legendary status as the earliest Christian monastic site in Britain and is by doomsday. It was the wealthiest abbey in all of England. One of its great abbots, St. Dunstan, devised the coronary celebration that's still used today, including that for Queen Elizabeth II. Now, the abbey also played a major part in the development of Arthurian legends and visitors could be following in the footsteps of the legendary King Arthur, whose grave monks in the 12th century claimed to have discovered. They can also take the opportunity to see the holy thorn believed to be descended from the staff of Joseph of Arimathea. In AD 37, Joseph of Arimathea, Jesus' wealthy uncle, reputedly brought vessels containing the blood of Jesus to Glastonbury, and with him, Christianity came to England. Joseph's visit is plausible long before Christ. Locals traded lead and tin to merchants from the Levant. Now, while this story is proven by fourth century writings that are accepted by the church, the King Arthur and the Holy Grail legends that it inspired are not. Those medieval tales came when England needed a morale-boosting folk hero for inspiration during the war with France. They pointed to the ancient Celtic sanctuary at Glastonbury as proof enough of the greatness of the 5th century warlord Arthur. In 1191, after a huge fire, Arthur's supposed remains, along with those of Queen Guinevere, were dug up from the Abbey Garden. Reburied in the Abbey Choir, Arthur and Guinevere's gravesite is a shrine today, and many think that the Grail's trail ends at the bottom of the Chalice Well, a natural spring at the base of the Glastonbury Tor. By the 10th century, Glastonbury Abbey was England's most powerful and wealthy, and was part of a nationwide network of monasteries that by 1500 owned one quarter of all English land and had four times the income of even the crown. Well, then Henry VIII came along and he dissolved the abbey in 1536. He was particularly harsh on Glastonbury. Not only did he destroy the abbey, but he also hung and quartered the abbot, sending parts of his body on four different national tours at the same time. This was meant as a warning to the other religious clerics, and it worked. Here's the site of King Arthur's tomb and a sign that says in the year 1191, the bodies of King Arthur and his queen were said to have been found on the south side of the Lady Chapel. On the 19th of April, 1278, their remains were removed in the presence of King Edward I and Queen Eleanor to a black marble tomb on this site. This tomb survived until the dissolution of the Abbey in 1539. So it got torn down, it got burned down, the glass and berry rebounded. In the 18th century, publicity campaign was struck up and thousands signed affidavits saying that they had been healed by the water in the chalice well. And once again, Glastonbury was on the tourist map. And today, Glastonbury and its tour are a center for searchers. Too creepy for the mainstream church, but just right for those looking for a place to recharge their crystals. 
Glastonbury is also synonymous with its summer music and arts festival, which we drove by, and a long hair and mud Woodstock recreation that's the site and rite of passage for young music lovers in Britain. You know, part of the fun of a visit to someplace like this is just being in a town or an area where every other shop and eatery is a new age place. I mean, locals who are not into this complain. But on the main street in Glastonbury, you can buy any kind of magic crystal or incense, but you can't get a roll of toilet paper. But as this countercultural is this town's and this area's bread and butter, they do their best to sit in their pubs. I'm sure they go, oh. Might be a few dots of rain on the camera lens here as we're dealing with some typical English weather. Sun is out. Jackie puts her glasses on. Puts the glasses on. Starts to rain. But, you know, I, I'm just looking down this. This is a thing. This is that lady chapel. We came in the other side. And then I, if I turn the camera here, you can see this goes all the way back past the graves. It's called the grave at the end. Now, you know, when this thing is was built and was all covered, it was enormous. I mean, this is an enormous abbey. It was long, but it was skinny. You can see it's not that broad across. But it measured 580 feet long, which was larger than York Minster today. We're going to go to York near the end of the trip. And it was Europe's largest building that was north of the Alps. <laughs> It was just enormous. And it was all torn down and all burned down with some fires and then tore apart by Henry VIII. Now here's a nice little legend here of the area. Now according to legend, when Joseph of Arimathea came here, he climbed the nearby Weary Wall Hill and he stuck his staff into the soil. And a thorn tree sprouted, and its descendants still stands there today. The trees here in the abbey are its offspring. Now, in 2010, vandals hacked off the branches of the original tree up on the hill. But you know what? Miraculously, the stump put out small green shoots the following spring, and the trees inside the abbey grounds bloom twice a year. Want to guess when? Yep, at Easter and at Christmas. So the story seems a little far-fetched to you, don't tell the queen, because a blossom from the Addie's tree sits proudly on her breakfast tail table every Christmas morning. <laughs>